Well, good morning. Who's happy to be here today? <clears throat> I know. I, I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad to be here, whether you're in uh, service live or watching online. Hey, before we jump into this, I'm really excited. We're going to uh, do communion at the end of our service. It's a great moment that we're going to share together. And I'm assuming everyone got one of these when you came in. If you did not, we'd love to get one in your hand. So if you didn't get one of these, you can just raise your hand and the ushers can come by and make sure that you get one. You know, we have been in this series, um, which I think has been just uh, a great series, um, called Shifting Your Focus, where we're going through uh, the book of Philippians and learning how to experience joy in everyday life. How many of you would like to have more joy in your life? I think, I think we all would, right? Well, the bottom line is what we're learning in this series is that that is all about focus, what we choose to focus on, and this is what we've been going through in the book, and we have this sort of theme that comes out of this. It says our, our focus drives our feelings. You could even extrapolate on that to say that our focus not only drives our feelings, but, but our actions, how we live out our life. So in other words, what we choose to be focused on is going to have huge implications on how we experience life and how we might experience joy in life. So, so today what I'm going to talk about in regarding focus is how we can find joy when we focus on unity. So it's really joy and unity. And we're going to look at uh, Philippians chapter 4. We're just going to look at three verses, the first three verses, uh, 1 through 3. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along to Philippians 4. If you uh, have the Green Valley app, you could also get on there, and you could also see the scriptures will be on the side screens as well. But as we start here today, how many of you, just to show of hands, thinks the world could use some more unity? <laughs> Yeah, right? Here's, here's another question. How many of you think that Christians themselves could use some more unity? Yeah, I think that's the reality of life is that, you know, we live in a world and that uh, we have lots of disagreements and we have a lot of disunity going on, sadly, even amongst fellow Christians. And, you know, we do it at, we have this disunity and this struggle at a couple of different levels. We have it certainly at the, the macro level in the world, you know, just sort of the global disunity that goes on. But we also have, have it at the micro level where we're looking at it from, you know, our relationships, our own relationships and the disunity that can come out of just the interactions that we have um, every day. And I, and I think it's safe to say that, you know, over the last couple of years, it's just gone on to, to hyperdrive in terms of the amount of disunity that exists in our world today. And, you know, the world itself is frantically trying to kind of fight an uphill battle on how people get unitized. How do you, how do you get unity and have people uh, experience unity together? That, that is just, in this world, as I think we'd all agree, it's just an uphill battle. I mean, you look at some of the politicians even out there trying to run on platforms about trying to bring unity and people together, and it's just so darn hard to do, you know? Reminds me of a story of a, a man who lived in a county, and he was running for a county seat in this one particular community, and this community had a really thriving Native American population, so of course this, this politician really wanted to connect with the Native American community as well, so he connected with a tribal leader there, and he says, hey, I'd like to come out and speak to your community here because they're such an important part of ours, and I'd like to you know, tell them that I'm a candidate. So this guy arranged it and said, yeah, and he actually drove this politician out to this gathering, which was a huge gathering, and so the guy gets up there, and the first thing he says to this community, he says, hey, if, if you elect me, I just want you to know that you as in the community, the Native American community, is important to me. And when he said that, it, they had this just cheer came out, and, and the cheer was this word hoa. They, just, they yelled out, hoa, 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 really excitable. And so this guy's standing there, and he's like, I don't know really what that means, but it seemed like they're happy and they like it, so I'm just going to keep going. So he, uh, he proceeds over 30 minutes and just promise after promise. Every time he made a promise, they responded with, hoa, hoa, hoa. And so at the end, finally, his last statement was, if you elect me, we're going to make this community a great place together. And it just went crazy, yelling, hoa, hoa, hoa. So he leaves with this tribal leader who drove him out, feeling really good, like, wow, I really connected with these people, right? So he's, he's driving out and you know, just feeling good about things. And as he's driving by, he sees this really beautiful 
grassy hill with these cattle out there. And, he, and he's just overwhelmed. And he tells the driver, he says, hey, could you stop? I want to get out and take a picture of this because my wife's an artist. And, and I want to take this picture because I know she wants to paint this. So this leader says, sure, I'll, I'll pull over. So he goes and pulls over. And as this politician's getting out to take a picture, he just looks at the man and says, hey, just one thing. There's a lot of cattle out there. So just be careful you don't step in any hoa. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have a, a lot of hoa that's flying around that causes a lot of disagreements in our world. You know, and the Apostle Paul, you know, he, he, he recognized this. And, and so what the Apostle Paul says and what we're going to learn today, he says, you know, there is nobody, there is no one person that is going to uni unify all people. Not even the person that lives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. There is only one person that can unify us, and that is Jesus Christ. And so we see in this text today, as he's talking to us in this, this book of Philippians, as he's dealing with this conflict that's going on with these two leaders, we start to learn about what that looks like in terms of Jesus Christ being the ultimate unifier in our lives and how that plays out every day in our lives. So I start with this big thought today, and it's just simply that, you know, a joy-filled life is a life united with others through Christ. You know, Paul talks about this in the book of Ephesians when he says that when, you know, when we uh, go into a relationship with Christ, we're adopted as a child of God. But it's even more than that. We're not just adopted as a child of God. We're actually become brothers and sisters with one another. We're adopted into a spiritual family. And so, so he builds on this through the book of Philippians. And if you look at all four chapters, through those first chapters, there's this thread of unity that goes through all of the chapters. You know, when you look at chapter one and he, and he tells the believers that your love should abound for one another. In other words, it should, it should grow between, the, you know, believers. And then in chapter two, he says that, you know, to be of a like mind as Christ, being one spirit. And then in chapter 3, which Larissa talked about last week, about be, us being citizens of heaven, there's just this connection point that says unity is the most important thing between believers. And so he gets to this, this idea of chapter 4. Uh, the church at Philippi is doing really well, and um, you know things are thriving, but lo and behold, because it's people, there's a conflict. And there's a conflict between these two women that are leaders in the church. And so he needs to address this because this is doubly bad. Obviously, conflict between disunity between believers. But these were also influential leaders in the church. So it started to have a snowball effect of how things would start to unravel with the church. So Paul addresses it. And how he addresses it, I'm just going to read these three verses, gives us some important insight about unity and how it plays out in our lives. This is what it says, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you who I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Eodia, and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, this is an amazing text because what Paul is saying here, he's addressing this issue, and he's saying, I want to help you guys be unified. And the way he does it and, the, and what we see in his writings here give us two truths about unity that I think are really important for us in terms of how we live our lives with one another and stay unified. Two, just two points today. And I'll spend most of the time on the first one. The, but the first truth is this out of this, is that the gospel is bigger than our disagreements. Amen. The, the gospel is bigger than our disagreements. Now, I, you know, for hundreds of years that scholars had no idea what the issue was with these two women, you know, what they were fighting over. There was no, they had no idea what it was, but believe it or not, just in the last, you know, 50 years, they actually identified what the problem was, which is amazing. All this years and all this study, all these scholars, and then all of a sudden, they, they found out what the issue was. And the issue was apparently Iodia, Iodia, she was... A Raider fan. 
Okay, I know, come on. You know what? It's like Where's Waldo, right? I'm going to throw it in there at some point in every service. But uh, no, they did not know what the issue was. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter, right? You can just fill in the blank what the issue is. That's all. You know, hey, I... Uh, I offended somebody, or that person offended me, or I'm upset at that person because they, you know, they're rude, or I don't like the way they, you know, talk, or, hey, I don't like the way this decision was made at the church, or, you know, the list goes on and on, right? The reality is, is that we don't have to know, but we also all know the impact it can have when we hold on to bitterness and disagreements in terms of our relationships, right? Right? But also play that out, how that then affects a church body. Sometimes people go like, wow, these are leaders. I can't imagine leaders of a church actually not being united and having conflict. And I would just say this, why not? It's people. And we're all broken. We all have our issues. We're all dysfunctional at times. I'm right there on the top of the list. So it is people. But the fact is that it can do a lot of damage. Let me just say this about unity. Unity, and, and I think you, you, you mostly know this, but unity isn't about us all agreeing on everything the same way. Unity isn't about us all having the same preferences and the same opinions and liking the same things. It is not that at all. Why? Because we are all individually, uniquely created. There is no two people alike. We have a uniqueness that comes from God. In other words, there is no two of you. Some of you might say, thank goodness for that, right? I mean, I have two granddaughters that are identical twins, and on the outside, you, when you see them, you can't tell them apart. You get to know them. They couldn't be more different. Why? It's because God has uniquely created each and every one of us individually. It's like what Oscar Wilde says. He says, you're unique like everyone else, right? <laughs> Take a minute, turn to the person next to you and just say, you're unique. Just say that. You're unique. Say that. Doesn't that feel good? <laughs> Now, I just want to say, that is, don't use that as a euphemism for, like, you're a weirdo. Don't be like, oh, yeah, you're unique, yeah, you know. That's not what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but this is why it's important that we understand this about our uniqueness is because we are unique, we are going to have differences, and we are going to have conflict. We're not going to think the same way, but the miracle of the gospel message is, is that God takes all of that uniqueness and unites it all through the gospel. That's the miracle of the gospel. It's way bigger than our disagreements. It's way bigger than our uniqueness. I don't know if you've ever saw the movie or read the story about John Soley, who was the pilot for U.S. Air that in 2009 was, was leaving LaGuardia. And uh, as they were ascending out of uh, New York, they hit a flock of Canada geese that just went into one of the engines and took the whole engine out. And so with 154 people on the plane, Soli had to, to land the plane in the Hudson River in January. Amazing thing about it is all 154 people survived. But what's even more amazing is what happened after that. There was a bond with those people that was like no other. They all of a sudden, different walks of life, different um, ethnicities, different cultural backgrounds, different financial statuses. There was 154 people on that plane that were all different that came together for one reason and one reason only, and that was they got a new lease on life. And they, understand that, that they all understood that they were not going to be able to do that themselves. That's the gospel. See, when we come together, what we get to come together for, friends, is the understanding that we could not do what God did for us through his son, Jesus Christ, and we have a new gift of life, and he's given it to others, and we can live with gratitude with one another. That's bigger than our disagreements. You might say, yeah, yeah I believe that. I believe the gospel. Yes, yes, but that person hurt me. And I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, 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 I get that. The, the gospel is bigger than disagreements. But yeah, you, you know what? That person, I, I can't forgive them. They betrayed me. Yeah, I, I know the gospel is, is bigger than our disagreements. But you know what? That person just irritates me. And I would just say this. The yes is the gospel, which makes the but secondary. The gospel trumps our yeah, but. I'm not saying that our issues are unimportant. What I'm saying is there's something much bigger out there in play 
that trumps our disagreements, and that's the gospel. You know, I think that it's not our disagreements and our differing opinions that's the problem. It's how we express those to one another that's the problem. That's where I feel like sometimes we can get off base. I, I, think, I think there's times that in our, in our sort of lives and our, in our fervor and our, our, our sort of passion and our, and our convictions that so often we can put that fervor and energy on secondary things instead of where it needs to be and that is spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. It's easy to get those mixed up. A couple of years ago with COVID, as difficult and terrible as it has been, one of the things that was birthed out of it, which is amazing, is our digital missions ministry. We've, we've got this amazing tech team that put together, you know, just kind of um, just on the fly almost, just this technology, be able to get the gospel out there to this world in different ways than we ever could imagine. We've got people connected that are seeing messages and seeing resources literally all over the world. It's just an amazing thing this whole idea of digital missions. But you know, on the flip side of that, the enemy has a digital mission strategy as well. Satan has a digital ministry, uh, digital mission strategy, and that is to spread disunity to the world at a global level. And all he has to do is get that technology into the right hands to make it happen. You know, I'm, uh, I was never a big user of social media um, before, but I, I chose to, to stop using it a couple of years ago. And I'm by no means telling you to not use social media. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I personally chose to stop using it. And you know the reason why? Not because I was angry, not because I was frustrated. It's because I was sad. I was sad to see some of what was going on and what sort of things were being said back and forth to people of what people were just willing to put out there, even Christians to other Christians. It just saddened me. It made me think of that sort of that saying that, that somebody said that said that, you know, for some people they won't let anything stand in the way of their convictions, including kindness. And it broke my heart, honestly. The question is, for all of us, what are you spreading? When you get frustrated with somebody, when you have a disagreement with somebody, when you have a, a dislike for somebody, what are you spreading? What are you spreading? Is it the gospel or is it something else? Hola. <laughs> Paul tells these two women, as he's there and he's in, just pleading with them, he's, he's saying to them, hey, he, he talks to them and reminds them, hey, you've been by my side in the cause of the gospel. What he's saying to them is, hey, don't forget the work, the energy you're putting into this. He's not downplaying their issues, but he says, rise above it. Do you remember the work of the gospel right by my side and what's happening with the gospel? It's bigger than your disagreements is what he's saying. And then he goes on to say something really significant. He says, he mentions both of these women in the book of life. He says, both of your names are in the book of life. That, that's an amazing statement right there on a couple of levels that, that really hit me when he uses this idea of mentioning that in this conflict of them being in the book of life. The first one is this, is, is that because when he talks about the book of life, he's talking about you guys are going to be together in eternity. So what I think on one hand, he's saying, hey, you guys are going to be together for a long time. You need to figure out how to get along right? I mean, if we're in church, but I, I'm sure we would all admit that there's probably some people that we're going to be more excited about seeing in heaven than others, right? I mean, that's just it. I mean, there's probably some people that you'd walk and go, hey, you made it. Yay. <laughs> Woo. Some people probably say that about us too, though, right? Have you, ever, have you ever gone somewhere where you had to spend a lot of time with somebody that you really didn't get along with, but you had to spend a lot of time with them? Classic for me is family vacations. You know, my brother and I were very close, but we were, we were rivals, right? So we were fighting all the time. And so one time my parents went on this vacation 3,000 miles across the country. I'm the youngest of five kids. 
I'm the favorite, of course, but we were, um, they had a 1972 station wagon, Impala, right? No seatbelts, no nothing, and they just throw us all in this thing. This li- thing was literally like a bounce house on wheels, right? <laughs> we're in the back just fighting and, you know, hey, he's touching me. Hey, stop looking at me. Hey, don't do that. You know, bad. So we probably heard about 10 times from my dad, hey, don't make me pull the car over and come back there. Have you ever heard that? Oh, yeah. Have you ever said that? Hey, don't make me pull the car over and come back there. It got so bad at one point in the trip that my dad did come back there. But the thing is, I don't think he ever pulled the car over. <laughs> my mom's probably like this, right? But he said something to us finally, and, I, and I'll never forget it. And this is the point with Paul. He says, he says you guys are going to spend a lot of time together. You better figure out how to get along. This is what he's saying. So Paul says, you guys' names are in the book. You're both going to be in eternity together. But there's there's something even more significant about this book, because when he says a book, Paul's giving this phenomenal, literal illustration of what unity looks like, and he uses that of a book. Think about a book. That you've got these pages that are all individual pages that come together, that are bound together, that have a spine that puts them all together, and it becomes a book. And the, the thing that it becomes is on the outside of the spine that identifies it, but it's a makeup of lots of different paper. And what Paul's saying here is, is that this is how we're united in Christ, is that we're all pieces of paper in the book of life that come together as one, bound together by Jesus Christ is what he's saying. And so he's saying, you can't go ripping pa- paper out of the books just because you don't want to be with somebody. I, I love this story I was, I was reading about. I want to show you this picture. This, this picture was purchased by an art collector in 1998 at Christie's uh, for $21,000. And, and it, was, it was thought to be a, um, a German artist in the 19th century that painted this picture. And so this guy that bought it had a lot of contacts. He, he knew a lot of people and said, that something doesn't sound right about this. So started doing lots of investigation of this picture and come to find out two things. One is it was ripped out of a book. It was part of a book at one time. They knew it from the vellum, and you can't see it in this, but the stitching on the side, because it's all imperfect at that time in terms of how it lines up. They saw it was torn out of a book. The second thing they realized is it's a lot older than the 19th century, and come to find out it was some, from 1490. And even more than that, what it was, actually, they found out, was a picture that was done by Leonardo da Vinci. And through a needle in a haystack search, they found a book when he was under commission for the Duke of Milan, that this this is the Duke's daughter who was getting married, and it was traditional to give them a book of poetry, and in that, they commissioned Leonardo to paint that picture of the daughter that was given in this book. And the amazing thing is, after all of this search, they found the book in... in, um, in uh, Warsaw, Poland, and they opened that book up and they took that page and found that missing page and lined it right up into that book perfectly. And you know what happened when that happened? You couldn't put a price on that picture. You couldn't put a price on that picture. See, this is, this is my point about this is because Paul tells us also in Ephesians that we are, are a, a masterpiece of God, new, made new in Christ Jesus, that we are a masterpiece. And he says that, that you are invaluable based upon who, you're cre- who created you and where you belong because the minute you're in that book with everyone else, you're valuable. And we have to see everyone through that gospel lens that they matter, that they're important, that they have worth, that they're valuable, and that they are also forgivable. And Paul says, don't lose sight of that, that the gospel's bigger than your disagreements. Here's the thing I think is really important for us to understand when it comes to unity. Our job as Christ followers, as church family, our job is not to create unity. Our job is to protect unity. Can you see the difference of those two things? Because it's very different if you go in. We've been unified by something way bigger than ourselves. And again, that is through Christ. We're part of this book bound together in Christ. We're not creating unity. What our job is is to protect the unity that God has given us. And when we go into relationships where there's conflict, I don't know about you, but that looks a lot different when I can go in and say, wow, we're already together We just need to fix some things. I mean, think about my brother. I fight my brother all the time, but at the end of the day, you know what was a given? He's my brother. 
That's already there. And what Paul says is here is, he says, protect that unity. In fact, he starts out this whole text. You know how he starts it out? He says, stand in the Lord. In other words, what he's saying is, you got to fight for that unity. He says, fight for it. Do you fight for unity in your relationships? I mean, we fight a lot about a lot, about a lot of things, right? We, we fight about all kinds of things. I know I do. But do you fight about, for unity? Is that a non-negotiable when you have conflict is to say, the one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fight for unity in your marriage, in your families? Do you fight for unity with your brothers and sisters in Christ and your church family? Because this is what Paul is saying when he says, stand in the Lord. Stand strong. Protect it. I have this dog and I show her periodically. She's a German short hair pointer and yes, that's one of my socks. I have a lot of single socks because she takes and buries my socks. That's how much she loves me. (laughs) But she's named Grace and there's several reasons why that's a perfect name for her. The first one is, is she needs a lot of Grace because she steals my socks. But the other thing is that I, I love it is that I can just be a a doof sometimes and she still loves me. I can be a nut and make mistakes and you know what, she always gives me grace. You, you know the other thing about her too that I love is she will not let anything get in the way that would divide our closeness to a point, not even my wife. <laughs> But she just has this attachment that she is not going to let anything stand in her way of us being close. And I think that's a beautiful picture of what it means to fight for unity. We need people in our life, friends, that will give us grace when we make mistakes. But at the bottom line is we're going to do whatever it takes to not let anything get in the way of us or stay in the way of us. I was thinking about this last week. I have my good friend Christy Shebley, who I work with. You know, I, I, we had a, a run-in. We had conflict, right? And I know for myself, I, I joke about it, but it's true. Sometimes I, I know lots about me, just insight about myself. And, and sometimes, you know, I, I know this about me, is that I can be just a stupid man, <laughs> selfish, whatever, and so we just had this thing that, that happened. It was a work-related, and we just had some conflict. And you know what? You know what I love about Christy? She's a fighter for unity. Yes, we had to address some real things. Yes, we had to hash some things out. And we have, we've worked together for a long time. But I can tell you this. She is not going to let anything get in the way that's going to keep us separate. And when we're doing that, when we're fighting that way, you know what? Our fights look a lot different because that's on the table that says, yeah, we can disagree. Yeah, I can be mad at you. Yeah, we can argue. But you know what? I'm going to fight like heck that something doesn't stay between us. Are you a fighter for unity? Or are you just fighting about something else? I think there's a reality that we have in our lives that We forget a lot of times because we can get so narrowly focused about just the stuff that's right in front of us, the hurt. And I I don't want to diminish any of that if you're going through, you've been hurt by people and you're in conflict. But, but, But it's so easy to lose focus of what God has given us to begin with through Christ, and that's the gift of unity. Johnny Erickson Tata has a, a great quote, and it's just that reminder for all of us. When she said, um, she said, believers are never told to become one. We already are one and are expected to act like it. Question is, are you acting like it? Are you acting like it? What are you spreading? You're spreading the gospel. Because the gospel is about reconciliation. The gospel is about love, even when we're not feeling loved. You know, when it comes to unity or our, or our division, we have one of two things we're going to do to the watching world. We're either going to validate or shock the world with our unity or lack thereof. When we have division, we're just validating sort of the world's opinion. says, look, typical Christians, look, hypocrites fighting with each other. Or we can shock the world 
We can shock the world in the sense to say, wow, how do people come together from different walks of life, different backgrounds, and yet can come together in the power of together? That'll shock the world. See, the greatest witness to the world that we have is with our witness with each other. That's really what the world noticed. And I don't know about you. I don't know about you. But I don't want to validate the world. I want to shock the world. I want to be part of a church that's going to shock the world with our unity. So Paul says that first thing is that the gospel is bigger than our disagreement. Second one, and this one I'll, I'll go through a little bit quicker. The second one is this, is that unity is a team effort. Unity really is a team effort. And I think that's so important. You know, I was reading a story about the, the 2011 Boston Red Sox, and they were arguably... Um, the most talented team put together in about 50 years, they were saying. All the, all the predictions were before that season that they were going to win the World Series hands down. They just had this amazing talent. Well, they ended up finished last in their division, and the, uh, the last two months was just an epic fail in terms of their um, losing streak. And the p- bottom line, the problem was disunity. Everybody was doing for themselves. There was a lot of infighting. There was a lot of backbiting. There was a lot of competition. There was like everybody was looking out for number one and they just literally imploded. And they held this sort of whole team culpable for this, not just the ones that were really doing most of the fighting. They, they held the manager, they held the coaches responsible, and other team members that didn't interject and go, hey, we got to fix this because the team's falling apart. And it reminds us of just in the, our, the kingdom work God has called us to do as we go through this journey. We have to remember that long-term disunity or things that don't get resolved or bitterness that's held on to, you know, those things will have a lasting effect of taking a church out of the game to be a kingdom-building church. It'll take individuals out of the game of being kingdom-building people. And so because we are a family, because we are a body, because we are a team, we have to care as a team about the team and do our part to be good team members in helping to keep unity. Paul shows us three really important ways that we can be great team members right here in the text. First one is great team members, they care for one another. They care for one another. Look what it says in verse 1. It says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you who I love, love and long for. He's not railing on these two leaders because they're not unified. He starts out with, I love you. I wish I could be around you. See, what we got to remember when it comes to team is a team is still made up of individuals, and individuals matter, and individuals need care. And as we journey together in this life together, that we, are, we, are we investing in one another and expressing love to one another? That's why we talk about Big Wednesdays and our men's and women's Bible studies and discipleship so often because this is all about caring about one another on the team. How you doing? What are you struggling with? How can I be there for you? Second thing a great team member does, not, care for one, not only care for one another, but... but challenges one another. Great team members challenge one another. You know, remember, he's pleading with these two women. He's to be of the same mind as the Lord, he says. He actually, even in the text, um, enlists some other people that are part of the church to say, help these two leaders work out their differences. See, great team members, they challenge us to reconcile. They challenge us for unity. All of us have relationships in our life that God puts in our life, and all of us have had, had that experience with people when you're journeying alongside of them that they're going through something where there's some conflict. Not, maybe it doesn't have anything to do with you. And we can do one of two things in those situations. We can actually hinder or we can help somebody with unity. It's easy for us sometimes to go, well, I'm just going to withdraw. That's your problem. Go take care of it. Or we can actually make it worse by throwing some gas on the fire, by, by siding or aligning with people that are just digging a deeper line in the sand in terms of disunity, where we start to jump on the bandwagon about somebody else, where we start to agree or keep people frustrated and angry, our friends, just to align with them. And what we have to remember is to step back and go, the greatest thing that we can do is challenge people for reconciliation. Again, you don't have to be in their business. You don't have to tell them it's nothing of what they're going through. It's just helping them navigate the step 
of not letting anything in between one another. Great team members, they, don't, they, they, they care for one another, they challenge one another. last thing is they refocus one another. We, we refocus. It's so easy to get when we're in the moment of our bitterness or we're against somebody. It's so easy to get so narrow-focused or out of focus. And sometimes we need others to help us refocus. This whole series of shift your focus, sometimes we can't do that on our own and we need somebody else to help us get our focus back on the main thing. Larissa gave this great message last week about living with an eternal perspective, seeing the bigger picture of things. And sometimes we as great team members have to help one another see the bigger picture of things of what God is doing at work. So, So the question here is this. Are you a good team member? And the people in your life that are maybe going with conflict or having conflict, are you a good team member? Are you praying for them? Are you willing to sit down with them if they're going through this, not to throw gas on the fire, but help them through the process of reconciliation and encourage them? Are you a good team member when it comes to maybe helping people with refocus of seeing the bigger picture of what the main goal is, and that's the gospel bigger than anything else? Is that kind of team member you are? I know sometimes I am, I know sometimes I'm not. You know, Jesus was the ultimate example of a team member because he certainly cares for each and every one of us and he, and he will certainly challenge us in terms of what we're called to do. But ultimately, he's the one that refocuses us.